This short podcast talks you through the steps that you need to complete to successfully submit and hopefully pass your ICPP assignment. Your first assignment's obviously going to be a stressful time for you and I've tried to make the steps as simple as possible here. Everything that you need about the assignment is posted on Blackboard. Don't forget that we now operate a page count rather than a word count. The first thing you need to do is work out exactly what's being asked of you, how you're expected to produce the work and what the deadline is. And once you know that, you stick to that. Everything will be posted on Blackboard clearly. And if you have any questions, you need to go to the module leader for your profession. Whether you've written academic assignments before or not, there will be some apprehension. You are going to be stressed about the assignment. You need a plan. You need to start once you're given the assignment, work out the submission date and then work backwards from that. You will be given a supervisor who will give you some draft feedback. It's a very bad idea not to use them in terms of support and the staff are more than happy to advise you and there will be sessions along the programme to advise you about academic writing and referencing and so on. The next step is to actually start thinking about what you're going to do. We're all very good at making excuses not to start things. So the first thing that I would say is that you need some kind of plan. You need some kind of timeline. Even though you may not stick to it perfectly, we all need a plan. So I'm going to talk you through the steps, the way that I would approach this assignment. Navigating Blackboard can be a little bit tricky. So you need to make sure that you learn how to navigate Blackboard, especially since this is your first academic assignment. There's lots of support in the university and lots of support on Blackboard, but it can be difficult to find the information. Don't give up. If you can't find it, speak to your tutors. So for example, the physiotherapy module has a logo like this. Everything that you need is labeled in this box. The next thing that I would do is download all the important files that I need and either print them out and put them on your wall or save them to your hard drive. You will be assigned a named academic to whom you can send a draft, which is one page of writing or a skeleton outline of what you want to write. It's very important that you take them up on this offer. Also, we are all told as a team not to look at drafts within two weeks of the date of submission. It just makes it unfair on other students if students are contacting us the night before a submission saying, can you have a look at this for me? There will be a clearly posted date for submission on Blackboard and that's usually 4 p.m. on the day in question. It's a good idea not to leave it until the very last minute. I would bring my deadline a day or two forwards. If you aren't successful when you submit the assignment and you don't pass it, we have a thing called an in-year retrieval, which means that you can usually resubmit the same assignment with changes a few weeks later. It's kind of a free shot and it's quite a useful idea because some people, the mistakes that you make are fairly easy to rectify. You don't have to do the in-year retrieval. If you need to do a reset, then the resubmission is usually in August, but the dates might vary. So down to the nitty gritty, this is a written assignment that you will submit electronically as a Word document. We don't do word counts anymore, it will be a page count and it's six pages in total. Your reference list doesn't count in the word count, in the page count rather, so it's a six page assignment. It's based around a thing called the Care Opinion website. So what I've done is I've selected four stories that are real stories produced by patients or carers or relatives. Three of them are about negative experiences and one of them is about a positive experience. 
what you need to do is choose one of those that you think is interesting and then use that as the means to get into the academic science behind communication. So you'll be able to find a couple of examples of poor communication and why it's gone wrong. What we want you to do is to refer to the story twice, otherwise there's no point having the story. So refer on two occasions to the story to give examples of communication, but don't forget that this is an academic assignment that needs to be referenced and it's about aspects of communication in healthcare. The next thing that I would suggest is once you've chosen your story, don't change your mind. It's very easy to be influenced by other people, friends, colleagues, other students. Don't. Once you've got something in mind, go with it and trust your gut. The way that I would write the assignment is to split my main body into two parts. So the first part is a more general covering of the theory behind communication. What is it and the different forms of communication? For example, verbal and nonverbal, paraphrasing, um, that kind of thing. And then the second part, a more specific part of communication. So focus on something like active listening, motivational interviewing, nonverbal communication, that kind of thing. So I think two parts to your main body is a good way to go. Generally speaking, at degree level, it's better to focus on one or two aspects and go into detail on them rather than trying to cover everything. There's no reason why you can't say at the outset, OK, um, communication is a really big topic. It's got 15 different components. I am going to focus on two of them. That's called signposting, and it's, it's quite good because it lets the reader know exactly where you're going to go with your writing. The next thing that I would do is get five or six pieces of paper, spread them out on the floor, and write these words on each piece of paper. So I would write introduction on one piece of paper, main body on the other. Now in this case, I've split the main body into two. Conclusion on one piece, references on another, and then the appendix. That would allow me to think about how I'm going to plan this, but you can do it electronically as well if you want. In a strange way, it might be better to write your introduction last of all because you don't yet know what you're going to be introducing. So that piece of paper that you put on the floor, put that to the bottom of the pile. And when you finish the main body, bring it back to the top and just literally summarize what you've said. So it's like if you go to buy a new book in a bookshop, you turn to the back cover. You want to know what the book's about. You don't want to read the book on the back cover. You just want three or four bullet points about what you're going to be experiencing for the next 1500 words or whatever. The main body is where the main thrust of your argument sits and it's going to be the biggest part of your assignment. The references appear in the main body. We don't usually want you to put references in your introduction or your conclusion. It's the main body where the references will sit. There is no rule about how many references to use, so I'm going to give you one. In a 1500 word assignment, you would usually use 15 references. So the good rule is one reference per 100 words of writing. If you include 15 references in this assignment, I will tell the marking team that that number is fair. So you'll get an OK mark for referencing, but it will just be OK. Probably it's a good idea to go above 15. So I would suggest 20 references. Your conclusion is fairly brief and to the point, and it pulls things together and tells the reader what you've just told them. Don't include references in your conclusion and don't start bringing in any new information in your conclusion. Your reference list starts on a new page. I want 15 sources and it's called a reference list and not a bibliography. Make sure that your reference list is presented professionally. Make sure it's presented in alphabetical order by author surname. So Mr. Aardvark will be the first and Mr. Watson will be at the end. Here's a list of potential topics that you might want to consider for your communication. So I'm going to stop talking and just let you read that for a few moments. You submit this electronically and you get an electronic grid or a rubric back with your mark on it. The way that we allocate the marks is below. So we give you 40% to your knowledge, 20% to your cognitive process. In other words, how do you problem solve and work things out? 
20% for the communication of your writing and 20% for referencing and the pass mark is 40%. Referencing is probably one of the hardest things to get your head around and it's certainly one of the things that students get most stressed about. Like most things in life, once you know what the rules are, it's not too difficult. Uh, but I realise that some of you will have not written before with references. So the next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about what referencing is and why it's important. Please forgive me for this. It's kind of a silly example, but there is a serious point to this. So I'm going to use an example of a sentence or a statement to illustrate why it's important that we reference something. So if you just wrote in your assignment, Stuart is hot, that is your opinion. It might be true, it might not be true, but you're not really giving any background towards the science behind what's been said about how hot I actually am. So it's far better to acknowledge the work of somebody else who says that Stuart is hot. Ideally, somebody that's been published in a peer reviewed journal or a textbook. Now, peer review is the process that we use in science to try and ensure academic rigor or high standards. And it works like this. So my area of interest is rheumatology. If I do a research article on ankylosing spondylitis, I then need to get that published. I will send it to the best quality rheumatology journal that I can find. They will get back to me and say, thank you very much, we'll let you know. They will then send that journal article that I've written to three experts who are similar background to me all over the world. They're my peers. They will then have a look at it and read it and they will fill a report in that says either this is rubbish, don't publish it, or it's brilliant, publish it tomorrow, or more likely they will find fault with it somewhere. So they will say, yeah, well, the graphs aren't very well researched, the statistics aren't very appropriate, there's no evidence that he got ethical approval, the sample size is too small, he's making conclusions that don't stand up to scrutiny, and so on. So peer review is something that makes your referencing safe. If you use something that's gone through a medical database like Medline or CINAHL, you're usually safe because it's usually been peer reviewed. Books are okay, but they're not considered to be Premier League. The kind of championship level are a little bit less superior. But if you're writing an assignment about something like, say, the hip joint, hip anatomy hasn't changed for the past 50,000 years. There's no reason why you can't use a textbook to define the type of joint that the hip joint is. But then if your assignment goes on to talk about some more advanced techniques, you then need to switch to academic journals. Now there are two different ways you can present a reference. You can either directly quote what somebody else has said. So if somebody called Johnson in 2008 wrote a book about how hot I was, you can quote them. You put Stuart is hot in speech marks and you give a page number for where Johnson said it. That's okay. It's not the best way of doing things because once you start using a lot of direct quotations, it kind of limits your own ability to tell your own story. So it's probably better to paraphrase. You still need to reference it because it's the idea that Johnson had that's copyrighted. It's not the written word only. So you can paraphrase what Johnson wrote about me, but you still need to acknowledge that you got the idea from Johnson in the first place. So once you get that sorted, the problem then is that you end up just piling reference after reference and it becomes very difficult to read. So I've given you an example here where you've just got multiple references, one after the other. It's quite dry, it's quite hard to read and it eats into your word count. So you'll be accused, not accused, but you'll be criticized for being descriptive. You've just listed the ingredients rather than tried to bake a cake with them. So a really useful trick is to try and group together themes and that suggests that you've really done your reading and you've really done your research and your homework. So if you are writing an assignment about how hot Stuart is, you end up with 10 journal articles. You find five that say that he is hot and five that say that he isn't. And then you present that and you say that a detailed review of the literature reviews that there are two different schools of thought. The following authors think that Stuart is hot and the other authors think that Stuart isn't. It's much more advanced, it's much more free flowing, and it gives a, a better sense that you've really engaged with the literature.
Now at level four, which is your first year, it's okay to just use the references and present back the data really, but at higher levels in years five and six, that won't suffice. So rather than just quoting other people, so if we go back to the Johnson quote, it's okay at level four to say, according to Johnson, 2008, Stuart is hot, that's fine. It's better at higher levels to start to critique the literature, so to start to actually pull apart what the literature has said. So for example, if you find the journal article by Johnson, it may be that Johnson was biased towards me because I've done them a favor in the past, or it may be the opposite. If you can start to engage with the quality of the literature and what's going on, that's a really good trick. It's quite hard to do at level four, but if you can start to present critique of the literature and counter arguments, that's gonna be very successful for you. Bear with me, there's a lot of text on this slide, but I thought this might be useful. So this is a paragraph or two from my PhD, and I've modified it slightly to include some referencing errors and omissions that I thought might be useful for you. So I'm gonna read it word for word and talk you through what the referencing errors are in this few paragraphs. So ankylosing spondylitis, brackets AS, that's fine. If you're going to use an abbreviation, write the word out in full, then write the abbreviation in brackets, and from that point on, you can use the word AS, so that's fine. Effects between 0.5 and 1.5% of the population of the United Kingdom. That's true, it does, but you need to say where you got that information from. Even if you're writing something which seems really obvious, like communication is important in effective healthcare, you need to reference it, you need to back it up. The term derives from the Greek word ankylos meaning bent and spondylos meaning spine. You could use a dictionary definition here if you wanted to, but dictionary definitions generally are not well thought of. But since this is a word definition, I think that would be okay. It's part of a group of conditions known as spondylarthropathies that are characterized by shared symptoms and genetic predisposition. That's okay. The first account of the effects of AS on the skeleton was given in 1691 by Bernard Connor who described the changes that he saw in the fused skeleton of a person with AS. Then we've got a quote from Bernard Connor. Now, students often want to know if a reference is old, does that mean it's no good? Not necessarily, it depends. So this is taken from the very first page of my PhD. And it was important that I set the scene and tell the reader what ankylosing spondylitis is and when it was first recognized. So it is important that I go back to the start and when it was first diagnosed. If there's a reason why you're going back to 1691, then that's fine. If there isn't, you've got to be careful. So a general rule of thumb is don't go back much more than 10 years. So if we read on after the quote, occasional cases of atlantoaxial subluxation are reported, brackets Lee. There's no year there. It should say Lee 1985 or whatever. Osteitis pubis and sacroiliitis are common. But the most commonly affected peripheral joint is the hip, particularly in the young age onset AS. Brackets, Kalin 1923. That's fine because Kalin was a world leader in this, but it's a very old source. If you start using a lot of old sources, we're going to get a little bit twitchy about that. So our, our hackles are up kind of thing. Inflammatory arthropathy of the sternoclavicular and the coromioclavicular joints has been reported. MREGW 1991. We need to get rid of those initials. Students are always putting initials in and we don't need them. So that should say Emory 1991. It was also commented on in Strictly Come Dancing in 2016. That is completely irrelevant. It's not peer reviewed and it's not academic science. Take it out. Areas most frequently involved are the calcaneal attachment of the plantar fascia and Achilles tendon. Lecturer handout 2002. Now, even though your handouts from my colleagues are first rate, they really are outstanding. If they're not published, you don't use them. They are not peer reviewed. You take them out. AS affects the spinal, sacroiliac and peripheral joints as well as non-articular tissues. That could do with a reference really because you're relying on that statement. It typically affects young adults with a male to female ratio of three to one. Another lecturer handout, 1990, no. The characteristic pathological feature of AS is enthesitis, which is inflammation at the site of attachment of ligaments or tendons to bone. That could do with a reference. 
the exact inflammatory, microbiologic and immunologic events occurring at the sites of enthesis have not yet been fully defined. www.myowncureforasrocks.com Now I'm being silly here, but there is a serious point. You've got to be very careful with the internet. The only internet references that I want you to use for this assignment are government documents, the NHS, the World Health Organization, or government white papers, such as the Marmot Review, or some big, serious um, legal case. Other than that, I don't want to see web links. We get very twitchy when we see web links. I believe, for straight away, if you use the word I, we have a problem. We don't want you to write in the first person. I believe that in AS, bony bridges known as syndesmophytes at the margins of the vertebrae of the spine are a typical finding in AS. Hamuda et al. 1995. There are no brackets here. We need to put Hamuda et al. 1995 in brackets. Now this is different than the way that you would re reference normally in APA version 6. You need to have a look at the guidelines about how you reference more than two, three, four, five, or six authors. It's quite important. These may fuse, brackets, ankylose, and this is described cl clinically as a bamboo spine. The vertebrae in AS also typically take on a squared appearance. Ralston HH et al. 1992 take out the initials. I don't want them. These features may lead to postural deformities in extreme cases resulting in a question mark deformity. That's in inverted commas, so that suggests that it's a quotation, so that really should do with a, a reference, really. So-called because of the shape of the flex spinal column. In addition to spinal involvement, local tender areas are common at other entheses, for example, at the distal attachment of the medial collateral ligament of the knee, the costochondral joints of the thorax, the iliac crest of the pelvis, and the plantar fascia. That needs a reference as well. So I win the prize for the most simple PowerPoint in the history of education, but I thought it was worth doing this. I don't want to see the letter I as in, I am going to write about this, I am going to discuss that. That's called the first person. I don't want you to use that. You need to write in the third person. This also applies to statements like you can see or we can see. You need to write in a slightly more detached way. So rather than writing, I am going to write about communication, you need to rephrase it into this assignment will discuss communication. It's also important to look at the quality of the sources that you're looking at. So if you go through a recognized medical or academic database, you're going to be fine. But if you start looking at Google and Wikipedia and Physiopedia, although there is some useful information on there, no one would deny that, you don't write that I have gone on Google or I have gone on Wikipedia. It just hints that the fact that you've not done a rigorous search and the quality can't really be relied upon. Another piece of advice is not to use contractions. So don't write don't, put do not. Um, it's just going to look a little less professional if you abbreviate words. Students often ask whether it's a good idea to get somebody to read your work because they've got a previous degree or they teach somewhere else. It, yes, obviously, the more people that can look at it, the better, within reason, but just be aware that every profession and every course has its own nuances about how they want you to present their work. So by all means, get them to look at it. But probably the main thing that they can do is to look to see whether it makes sense. In a way, it might be better to show it to somebody who's got no connection with your profession, just to see whether what you've written is understandable to the reader. Another piece of advice, which I don't apologize for giving you, is to make multiple copies of your work. Make sure that you know which is the final version, obviously. But at some point in your career, you'll probably have the experience of losing work that you've spent ages on. And it's, it's quite devastating, really. So make sure that you make multiple copies. Make sure that you store things on the V drive, for example, or the cloud at university, whatever system we have in place. And always keep a separate copy on a USB, I would suggest. And I hope that that helped. Please let me know your thoughts.